Welcome to the Put Back on SNY.TV. I'm SNY's NBA insider, Ian Begley. Got a great show for you here, talking Knicks and the NBA. We've got Brendan Brown, three decades in the league as a scout, coach, and an announcer. And we got Kaz Famuide, of course, all over your screens, wherever you see your betting content. Obviously a big-time Nick fan, so you guys obviously know him well. But we're going to start off here with the baseline. Knicks playing well out west. They've got a clear path here to the number three seed in the east because you look at Cleveland, and Cleveland has Donovan Mitchell out for at least a week with a broken nose. Knicks' schedule is okay. Cleveland's schedule is okay regarding strength of schedule from the rest of the way out. Knicks dealing with their own injuries. OG and Anobi tweaked that surgically repaired right elbow. Uh, I was told that that inflammation irritation did show some improvement a day later after he went for that MRI, but the Knicks are going to take it slow there on Ananobi, so we're unsure when he is going to be back. Uh, We do know they wrap up this West Coast trip Thursday night against the Nuggets. They're going to go 4-0 on a West Coast trip here that they have looked really good, and Brendan, we will start with you. What has stood out to you as far as this trip and and what you've seen from the group? Well, when you think about the Knicks and you think about the Knicks under Tom Thibodeau and what he's been able to do in the last 20 games of the season, at this point in year four, he is now 45 and 21 at winning at the end of the season. You remember the 16 and four, you know, late in his first year, but he's been very good in the 37-win season and then these last two seasons. So the nature by which the Knicks won it, go to Sacramento, how they won at Golden State, you would say, oh, well, the defense is great and this, that, and the other, and it was. But the reality of it is those two defensive game plans couldn't have been more different. How the Knicks dealt with Fox, Monk off the bench, and then Sabonis, and then how they treated Curry and Thompson, the individual players that had to do different jobs in different parts of the game plan. But what it comes down to is this. A lot of teams are just flimsy. I call them flimsy. There are probably eight to ten teams in the league. They just want to run up and down. They don't want to play the physical game. The officiating since the All-Star break, it definitely favors teams that are physical. So for the Knicks to get off to an 18-4 to start at Golden State, it shows, hey, this is who we got, but we're for real. This is our game plan. And that's why the Knicks win late in the season, and they have enough centers to throw at Jokic tomorrow night. So you're playing with house money. Can you get the last game? You know, Brendan mentioned uh, the way that the, the, the league has been officiated after the All-Star break. And I feel like any 80s baby has been praying to the gods that we get back to a physical type of basketball, not just because I personally think it's more aesthetically pleasing, but I do believe that it benefits the way the Knicks have been playing basketball as of late. Tom Thibodeau has been doing some of the best work of his career, and this is a guy who's already won NBA Coach of the Year. But going from one defensive strategy when it came to playing against the Sacramento Kings and the guys like DeMontis Sabonis, who has been a double-double and triple-double machine, especially without OG Ananobi and Julius Randle in that lineup, and then switching over to the Golden State Warriors and starting Deuce McBride and just having that four-guard lineup of just absolute dogs, just guys who just get after it defensively and get up and down the floor offensively. Man, the Knicks have been looking really good on this West Coast trip. I would have personally been happy with a 500, uh, you know, record road trip going to the West. But now they got a chance to sweep it, especially after how good they played against the Denver Nuggets in Madison Square Garden. Obviously, you're playing with a little bit of house money, but now's the time you can get greedy. Because like you said, the third seed is in it's it's in reach right now, right? The Cleveland Cavaliers had a really hot February when the New York Knicks were dealing with a ton of injuries and everybody just sort of talked about having them hold water, stay above water around this entire time. They've done that. They are right in striking distance. While the Cavs have gone five and five in their last 10, the Knicks are six and four and are trending upwards, whether it's health, whether it's the way the Knicks have been playing, and more importantly, the way Jalen Brunson has been playing. It feels like every single time you think you've seen it all from this guy, he just takes it up another level 
and uh, it's March, so I guess we should expect it. But he has been uh, playing an insane level of basketball uh, ever since the All-Star break. Hey, Brendan, we haven't seen a lot of OG and an OB since he's come back, but what did you see from him in the, the limited minutes that he was on the floor before he re-aggravated that injury? Well, I think if you're looking at the Knicks and why they've been good and why they've won five out of six and four of those teams had winning records, this is a good trend as the Knicks are playing high-level basketball against good teams. The perimeter defenders – their ability to pressure the ball, their ability to deny the wings. When Ananobi is in the lineup and he can take like a maxi, although he didn't do that much in that game, but if he takes the main guy, it puts Steven Chenzo off the ball where he's so very good at playing the passing lanes, even being like a rover. But everyone who is defended on the perimeter early in the shot clock, the Knicks are giving people a lot of problems Hey, on a lot of nights, you can just run dribble handoffs or other actions, and you get into a possibility where you're getting a good shot. The Knicks, in the first 10 seconds of the shot clock, are pushing teams further out and further out. And obviously, with Ananobi in there against your main guy, that's going to make it even better. And then when it gets to the back end of the shot clock, you still have Hartenstein and Achua to protect the rim. So... You know, OG is the main guy in that defensive alignment. It moves everyone down one. But I give credit to all the perimeter defenders in what they've been able to do these last two, three weeks and why teams aren't getting to 100. Now, Kaz, with OG, you think the Knicks should be cautious here uh, now that he's re-aggravated something in the elbow? Do you think they should try to get him back as soon as possible because they're trying to win every game? I do think they'll be cautious. I've been told that that'll be the approach. But what's your stance? What do you think they should do here with Ananobi and this new injury? Well, I think the great thing about the Knicks organization recently is that they've been Fort Knox, right? So if they are being cautious, if they are rushing him back, we're not going to know until like minutes before tip-off whether guys are going to be playing or not. But me personally, I'd love to see them taking a little bit easy with OG and Anobi. Obviously, you could throw all the plus minuses out there. You could throw all the calculators, the math, everything you need to. When OG plays, the Knicks win basketball games, plain and simple. And when it comes to this playoff race, um, you're going to need OG and Anobi to guard the elite wings of the Eastern Conference. So you're looking at guys like Giannis Antetokounmpo. You're looking at guys like Jimmy Butler. Looking at guys, especially right now, in the first round match against Paolo Bancaro, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown. These are the guys that you're going to want to have OG Ananobi sick himself after. Now, defensively, I didn't see much of a drop off there. Like, we obviously all saw him wincing a little bit after aggravating that elbow and falling, and, and there was a little bit of swelling there. But the one thing that really worried me was, you know, his shot. And, you know, when he was getting that shot up a little bit, it didn't look as pure. It didn't look as as uh, as easy as it seems to have in the in the first 15 games that he's played as a Knicks. So that being said, as great as he is defensively, what really makes him stand out for this Knicks team is giving them another offensive weapon and spreading the floor out to allow the Nova Knicks like, you know, J Josh Hart, Dante DiVincenzo, and of course, Jalen Brunson to spread the court out. They're playing a little bit smaller without Julius Randle. They're playing a little bit smaller without uh, Isaiah Hartenstein coming off the bench as, as having those two big seven footers to play center. Um, so you want to keep that court spread. So OG, as great as he is defensively, you're going to need that elbow to be good to spread that court out, hit those corner threes, and even create a little bit when uh, you want to have three guards on the court and have OG use that incredible versatility defensively to guard great wings or guard great big men. And one thing to look at here is after the Denver game, Knicks have four games against teams under 500. So a little bit of a softer cushion there, though. Yeah, any, any night in the NBA is a tough night to win. When, quickly on Randall, Kaz, because you mentioned Julius. I don't know if he has been cleared for contact yet. I do know that as of that Golden State game, he hadn't been cleared for contact. That's the next big hurdle for Julius Randle. He's been sitting at this spot for a while now where he can do everything but take full contact and scrimmage five on five. And, you know, some people are just kind of wondering why. Why hasn't it happened yet? Obviously, that's up to the Nick medical staff. And, you know, we wait here to find out from Tom Thibodeau uh, when Julius Randle does get cleared. That's the big hurdle there. And then, you know, it's probably – 
uh, a week to 10 days until you see him back on the floor. But that's the timetable loosely for Randall. Let's talk about somebody who has been on the court for a while now. Jalen Brunson has really led this Nick team in the first three games of this West Coast trip. I mean, that Sacramento game, that Portland game, he was brilliant. And obviously Golden State as well. Uh, Kaz, I'm looking at you. When you see, when you hear Draymond Green say that Jalen Brunson's playing at an all NBA level, what does that mean when he's getting compliments from a player of that state stature, Draymond Green's stature? I would say that the uh, the soft launch of the Jalen Brunson superstar project is off and running, right? Like Draymond Green, one of the most famous voices in all of sports media, obviously. Uh, you go up and you play against the Golden State Warriors, and you know a lot of times he'll so he's not going to hold his tongue. He's not somebody who's going to say something that he doesn't really mean. And Draymond Green has probably forgot more about basketball than a lot of people will ever learn. So just as far as his cerebral approach to the game, he can truly appreciate how great a player Jalen Brunson is. Uh, he mentioned something about wanting to guard him uh, on the isolation more than he would on a pick and roll because – of just how fundamentally sound he is, how every single move that he has is a counter move to whatever you're going to do to guard him defensively. And this is a guy who is, yeah. by large accounts, one of the best defensive players we've ever seen in the NBA, saying this guy can score on all three levels of the court. He's a nightmare to defend off the pick and roll. And he just handed you a L on your court, right? So uh, add to the fact you know, Draymond Green saying this on his podcast. We're seeing the AT&T commercial that came out today with, with Sabrina Ionescu and uh, the Jalen screens and all that type of stuff. He's had the numbers. He's had the market. He's had the podcast now. I think the, the soft launch into sort of the entire league, knowing that this guy isn't just a good dude for his contract. He's not just a guy who got his first All-Star game. This is a true superstar player. In the NBA, and when you have superstar players, all you need is a little bit of help. All you need is a little bit of, uh, you know, backup when it comes to these playoff games. And he's already proven it on the biggest stages, whether it's in NCAA basketball, whether it's been in a playoff situation. And now he has the weight of expectations coming into the season because it seems like everybody is waiting or hoping for this Boston Celtics, New York Knicks, Eastern Conference Finals to hopefully play out. Health is going to, you know, really depend on if this happens. But Draymond Green, all the praise in the world to Jalen Brunson. He's saying what we've all saw about him ever since he first put on a New York Knicks uniform. He is an absolute stud and arguably, arguably, probably the best point guard to ever put on a New York Knicks uniform, not named Walt Clyde Frazier. That is heavy praise for a guy like that. Brendan, what about you? What have you seen from Jalen these first three games of the trip? Well, I'm going to do it a little differently. Um, let's talk about two things. Number one, what is the nature of the New York Knicks offense? What's the design? You know, how does it work? Well, we've gone through about three stages this year. So you had the old team that went 17 and 15, and there was a lot of five-man continuities, a lot of dribble handoffs, the start sets, and now you're developing into a scoring action. A lot of that had to do with R.J. Barrett. Well, R.J. Barrett was gone, and then we went into stage two of the offense, which looked a lot like a Tom Thibodeau Chicago offense with Derrick Rose. And you're running straight pick and rolls, side, high, step ups, all kinds of different kinds. But in reality, if you're doing that 80% of the time with Brunson, you might have just been wearing down Brunson with all the contact in all the different pick and rolls. So what have the Knicks done now? They've gone into stage three. Stage three is kind of like a starting pitcher in baseball with four or five pitches. So now you're running some pick and roll with him. But if you notice in the last two or three weeks, now they're bringing him off the ball a lot more. So he is going down to the baseline and coming off of pin downs or coming off dribble handoffs, or there's what's called a Phoenix set where he goes to the foul line and then he takes a screen, goes to the wing, and there are different options where you can use them there. So in trying to preserve Brunson, by bringing him off the ball a lot more, and DiVincenzo is essentially the point guard, A, that makes it harder to guard him because it's different areas of the floor where he's coming, and B, you're preserving how much contact 
you're getting on him, and that's vital. Like, if he goes down and then you're in the playoffs, or if he's not 100, you know, the Knicks still have offensive problems right now with getting enough points to win these games. So the funniest thing I hear about Brunson is number two. Well, just put a bigger guy on him. Okay, well, if you just put a bigger guy on him, like Harrison Barnes or Chris Murray on Sacramento, that doesn't mean anything. He has the footwork, he has the caginess to beat bigger guys and get 30 or 35 on them. So I think the whole notion of like, you're going to put a six, seven guy on him and he's not going to score. I don't think that's true at all. He's so crafty with his footwork that he's going to get good shots. Now, if you're talking about like Kelly Oubre and he's six, seven and he has length and he has good footwork, well, that's one of Jalen's not as good games lately was shooting the ball, but was he a hundred percent? But that type of a guy with size and with some foot quickness, if the Knicks get in the first round and they see a guy like that, well, that is a little bit more of a challenge. And now we're going back to, is he getting calls with contact when he goes to the basket or is he creating the contact? And that's why he's not getting to the line. But just putting a bigger guy on him, come on, this guy is unreal right now. And he can make threes and play with guys around the three-point line who are bigger guys, and he can beat them too. You know, another villain over Nick Josh Hart has been really good for this team of late. You know, five triple doubles in a very short span. And the interesting thing to me is uh, he talked to me about how he's going to have to manage this knee ailment that he's dealing with, jumper's knee that, that came out a few weeks back and he said you know it's something that he's dealt with throughout the course of his career but it came up earlier this year because he had played in the playoffs last year played team USA over the summer so it's going to be something that he was going to have to play through he's played through it phenomenally I mean he's had all his triple doubles within that span and he shot the ball incredibly well Kaz I'm interested to hear what you think about Hart and his importance to this team down the stretch in the postseason where do you rank him kind of in your power rankings of Knicks who need to play well for them to be good in these important games down the stretch in the postseason? Oh, man, I, I, had, a, I had a viral tweet a few weeks ago when I said Josh Hart is the Carmelo Anthony of Draymond Greens, right? Like he is the ultimate glue guy, but does it with a little bit more style, a little bit more flair, a little more built for New York City. Uh, I'd argue he's probably the second most important player in this injury hampered Knicks team so far, because when you lose Julius Randle, you're not just losing the big body. You're losing somebody that plays downhill. You're losing somebody who grabs a lot of rebounds and you're losing somebody who could spread the court and create offenses for other players. And that's what Josh Hart has done. Maybe he's not going to get you to 20 or 30 points that Julius Randle can get you on any single night. But what he has done is been a guy who can grab rebounds and push the break, which is so important. Why? Because he's taking Jalen Brunson off the ball. You're getting him opportunities to get, you know, uh, jump shots where he isn't necessarily handling the ball a bunch of times. Now you got three shooters in DiVincenzo, in Brunson, in McBride when he's in there. And you got Josh Hart, who pretty much runs HB dive every time he gets the ball. He's going straight to the hoop. <laughs> and if you stop him, you stop him. If not, he's shown that he can get to the open players. So um, anytime you could have somebody who could rebound the ball and start the fast break all in one setting, yeah, you'll get like some Draymond Green comparisons, I guess uh, even poor man's Jason Kidd comparisons, but it is so important. And I think that's what Julius Randle's absence has really shown with this Knicks team. Now, obviously he's a lot bigger than Josh Hart, but you can't measure what he's got inside his chest, man. And I think that's why Knicks fans love him. I think that's why he's ingratiated himself into this franchise uh, through the podcast, through everything else. It's been his game, man. It's been his ability to be versatile as a defender, as a rebounder, as a you know creator for other players, and his ability to shoot the ball a little bit. You know, when he first came into the Knicks, he was shooting lights out. He kind of came back down a little bit uh, to earth, but he's still somebody that you got to respect from downtown, and that is key, especially when we go towards the uh, the end of the season. You don't really know if you're gonna get Julius Randle back at 100. percent You might get him back at, at 60 or 70 or something like that. Josh Hart is going to be absolutely indispensable if the New York Knicks want to make a deep playoff run with a Julius Randle who will more than likely need surgery once once the season's over.
Yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly something that's on the table there for Randall uh, once this thing wraps up. Matt Spenley, we're coming to you. Matt is our SNY social media guru. He's also delivering fan questions to the show throughout the putback. Matt, I think you have two for us. What do you have? I do have two, and they are all related to Mitchell Robinson. So a lot of comments about Mitch, what his status is. Um, Mitch had a comment on Instagram, I think it was last week, um, about how he'd rather maybe come off the bench, that he could show more uh, when he eventually does come back. I know that's been a big discussion between Hartenstein, Mitch, who's going to start when we get closer to the playoffs, if we expect Mitch back, all these different things. So two questions. Um, I'm going to start with Brendan first. Keen Sauce on YouTube is asking, can Mitch really be a factor? And how do you expect him to be used in the postseason, assuming he comes back before the end of the regular season? I think to answer that question, the biggest concept there is, can you get him back in shape? And if you do get him back in shape somehow, which we only have 14 games left, there's not a lot of time to do this. And you can say, well, you know, work out one on O and do everything with the strength coaches and the trainer. But in reality, like getting him up to being able to play 15 to 18 minutes a game, in my estimation, my experience of the NBA, I'm not so sure that can happen at this point. Now you want it to happen, but I'm not sure that it can. And then when you're thinking about how you want to use them, well, I don't want to mess up the starting lineup that was so good in January when they went 14 and two, and the team is really good at both ends of the uh, floor. And it's very balanced with DiVincenzo and Hartenstein playing around the other guys and doing their job so well. So you're looking at Mitchell, if he's going to play at all, he's got to come off the bench. And now what's your bench group? Are you only playing eight guys? Are you only playing nine guys? Because that might affect your decisions. Now, who are you playing in the first round? Do you need Mitchell to be the backup center? Or is it Chua, who has rebounded and, you know, blocked some shots? He's done well, gets offensive rebounds. Is he just a flat-out better player at this moment than Mitch? And I'm as big a Mitch fan as there is going, all the way going back to his rookie year. But I don't know how they get him in game shape when it comes to like four weeks from now, we're playing game one in the first round. My general take, let's see Mitch back on the floor before we talk about bench starting what it's all going to be. Like, I just want to see this guy back on the floor healthy. All right, let's just get him back. Uh, All right, part two of the question is going to go to Kazanini, and I want to start with you on this one. Um, Nelson Benia, our guy on YouTube, is asking, what are the chances that both Hartenstein and Mitch will be back with the Knicks next season? I know we've addressed this throughout the season, um, but just the future of that position and if you think that that will be a tandem that we see moving forward for the Knicks. Look, I think if if Tom Thibodeau um, is making the decisions, and obviously he's not the only one making decisions, he's influential in the decision-making process, I do think that these guys will be back, uh, especially if Robinson can come back and show that he's healthy. Uh, you know, you talk about obviously Princess, uh, excuse me, Precious Chua, and Chua has played really well. Restricted free agent coming up here. Knicks also have Jericho Sims, so they have options at the center position. They do have, um, you know, players they could bring back. When you talk about Mitchell Robinson, Isaiah Hartenstein, though, Tom Thibodeau has loved this combination these two in particular, and the depth that he has at center. But let's be realistic. If the Knicks are going to go after a big-name player via trade this summer, you look at Mitchell Robinson, you look at his age, you look at his contract, and you look at what he's done to date, and you have to assume any teams in talks with the Knicks about a a bigger player coming to New York, they're going to be asking about Mitchell Robinson. So there's a reality there, too, for the Knicks when you talk about Robinson and his future. And I'm just going to say, and, and Leon, we trust, right? Like, if the New York Knicks want to hold on to Mitch Robinson and Isaiah Hartenstein, I have a feeling that they're going to be able to do it. I don't think we've seen a franchise in the NBA work the front office, work contracts better than the New York Knicks. I, I, there's just a handful of team-friendly deals on the Knicks right now, and it, it wouldn't surprise me if the Knicks can get Isaiah Hartenstein back on another team-friendly deal. However, He's played phenomenal this year. I don't think there's anybody on this New York Knicks team that has made themselves more money going forward than Isaiah Hartenstein. So I'm sure he's going to warrant a ton of attention next uh, offseason. However, you look at a guy like Deuce McBride, who signed earlier this year and is probably already 
overplaying that contract. We know what we're paying Jalen Brunson and how much he's getting paid. But um, you made an incredible point. The New York Knicks are more than likely going to go big game hunting this summer. And if they're going to do that, they're probably going to have to lose some people who make a little bit of money and are also talented. So in that situation, you have a little bit of flexibility, knowing that if you can go out and get somebody, you know what you're paying Mitchell Robinson. He's probably going to be somebody who will be on the block if they go in trades for someone. But Isaiah Hartenstein will be a free agent, and then there'll be opportunities to sort of, you know, work out a contract depending on what that team is going to look like next year. But I think Leon Rose and the front office of the New York Knicks have done an absolutely phenomenal job of getting players for, you know, less than market value, let's be honest. And, uh, you know, Isaiah Hartenstein, obviously, when it comes to the summer, is going to have his choice of suitors, of people who want starting centers who can pass, defend, rebound, and just make an overall positive impact on the court when they're on there. So me personally, I'd love to see him stay together. I'd love to see what they can do uh, on this brand new version of the Knicks. We haven't really seen Isaiah Hartenstein and Mitch Robinson play together with this ideation of the Knicks that we've seen this season but uh I, I got the the front office of the New York Knicks which I never thought I'd say uh in my 20 or 30 years of fandom have earned all of the cachet as far as how they're going to work the front office this year so I'll leave it up to them yeah one thing worth noting on Hartenstein uh Knicks the way the CBA rules are they can offer him I think about 17 mil a year roughly um, and other teams obviously would be able to exceed that if they do have the cap space to do so. So just something to keep an eye on there. You mentioned Deuce McBride, Kaz Deuce, also on that descending contract extension. Uh, Nick front office seems to, to really like those deals that descend. McBride played incredibly well, obviously, against Golden State the other night in that win. And that, to me, is just the culmination of the way he's played uh, night in and night out by and large since he's come back into the rotation after the Ananobi deal he's given the Knicks a big lift and Brendan I'm curious for you you're looking at Alec Burks you're looking at Deuce McBride you're looking at shortening the rotation as you get closer to the playoffs in the postseason how are you looking at that decision McBride versus Burks specifically when you talk about rotation spot and minutes well number one We've talked about this on this podcast before. Tom Thibodeau could go to eight guys, and then there is no McBride or Burks. They're not even in the rotation. And DiVincenzo can be the backup point guard. So if Tom wants to go to eight, he can. Now, let's say it's nine. Well, a month ago we said where are McBride and Burks, and people were hoping for good things out of Burks because of things he's done in the past for the Knicks. But, hey, it just hasn't played out that way in any way, shape, or form. So let's look at the last 10 games for McBride and for Burks. McBride averaging 11 a game. Burks averaging five a game. Burks is shooting 31% and 24% from three. The eye test is 100% McBride. But before you jump on that really hard, there's a difference a little bit with McBride when he does well and when he doesn't. The game before Golden State, because of the way that Tibbs did the game plan, he did not use McBride, but for 11 minutes when Fox and Monk were in the lineup. So you would think with Fox and Monk in the lineup that that's a great situation for Deuce, but he only got 11 minutes and he didn't score. So if you're one of these people who predicted go over on McBride for points the next night, he didn't score in Sacramento, and then he had – the most unbelievable game of unbelievable games for a backup point guard and a great night for him, not only shooting the ball and he shot when appropriately, when he was left alone. And that's what the NBA is about. It's about taking shots when they have said, we're going to play four on five and leave you alone. So awesome for him. Incredible job guarding Curry. It was a different strategic move by Tibbs to guard Curry and then guard Thompson that way off the bench. You're chasing the guy down the middle of his back on dribble handoffs, on pin downs. Hart did it the most with Thompson, but McBride was incredible. And yes, Tom, I mean, Curry gets 27, but he was not comfortable all night long. And then, you know, McBride, because he played the whole game, he went over to Chris Paul and he did a pretty good job on him. So he has shot in the last 10 games. 
49 from the field and 44 from three. So when you're worried about McBride, like, is he going to make open shots lately? He's doing a great job of that. When Tibbs is going to think about who's the backup point guard and who do I want doing that in the playoffs, he's going to go to turnovers because the Knicks are 30th in the league in pace. They are dead last. That means they play with the last amount of possessions. So what's the one thing you cannot do in a Tom Thibodeau offense? You cannot turn the ball over. Well, McBride has been great in that department lately. So not only is he giving you the shooting, when he is a starter, which is four of the ten games, I'm counting the Cleveland game as a start, he's 24-2 to two, assists the turnover. So that's 12-1, to one, which is like a remarkable, remarkable number. Like the leader of the league would be 6-7. to seven. Now what's the weird flip side of that? He only gets one assist a game when he plays with the bench. And this is still a mathematical problem for the Knicks because Bogdanovich is getting 11 a game, 39 and 33. Burks hasn't had it. McBride doesn't score as much coming off the bench. So they're 25th in the league in scoring the bench. Just like two years ago, they were 23rd. Last year, they were 26th. You can talk about net rating all you want. The, net, the Knicks lost to Miami in the second round last year because they got outscored by 91 points by Miami's bench, more than 15 a game. So Deuce has done well in the starting lineup. He's only shooting 40% overall, but he's making a good amount of threes, a little bit more than 40. But him running this second group and making this second group work, there's still some gray area there. But proving himself to be on the floor, to take big assignments, I think he's done all of that recently. You know, Brandon, I'm, I'm with you on that 100%, but I truly believe this game against the Golden State Warriors was a turning point in, in how this team is probably going to view Deuce McBride going towards the postseason, right? You hit the nail on the head. Last year, the Knicks lost against the Miami Heat because that second unit of the Heat absolutely outplayed the Knicks' second unit, right? And now, just as there's so much influx of, of new players coming to this Knicks team on the starting lineup, there was the same thing going on with this bench. So not only is Miles McBride starting to get more minutes, not only is he having to uh, have different assignments, but he also needs to help lead this new bench unit to be effective, to sort of hold off whoever is going to come after that elite starting lineup of Brunson and crew, right? So I, I like to play a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, armchair psychologist sometimes when it comes to Deuce McBride. And I hear a lot of the conversations that he has with Monica McNutt on, on uh, you know, the post games and stuff like that. And he straight up said he always had this confidence. He had this confidence in his game, even as a rookie. The only difference is he's getting more playing time. And to tell somebody, hey, OG Ananobi, our top defensive guy, his injury sort of flared up. We need you to jump in the starting lineup. And, oh, yes, by the way, go chase Stephen Curry around for 40 minutes. And not only does he do that, but he shoots the laces off the ball the entire night on the road in the game that you need. I mean, I really believe confidence is momentum-based. And Deuce McBride has had so much momentum throughout this uh, West Coast uh, swing. He is shooting with so much confidence. I feel like every time he gets the ball up, I do like a half second of, ah, oh, what's going on? And then it, it's water, right? So um, I'll say this, man. Deuce McBride, he has put himself in a position to really be a guy who can be key for this deep playoff run. Um, there's going to be wing defenders and wing players in the Eastern Conference that the Knicks are going to have to hound all, all series long. And there's going to be star guards that are going to need to be hounded all series long. Jalen Brunson, not necessarily your Gary Payton prototypical lockdown defender, but he is one of the league leaders in drawing charges. And one thing you don't want to do as a star guard when you know the person you're playing against is liable to take charges is having a dude that is just absolutely a pest on defense, chasing you all around. And we saw that with Stephen Curry. He didn't get his first three-pointer until late into the second quarter against the war against the New York Knicks. And he got his 27, but he made him work for every single last one of those points. So um, as far as Alec Burks is concerned, as far as the other point guard situation is concerned, uh, losing Emmanuel quickly in the, in, the, in the beginning of the year, having the opportunity to step up and sort of replace what Emmanuel quickly brought you, 
as a scoring guard. I think Deuce McBride has taken that, you know, responsibility personally. And anytime he's had a chance to really show what he can do, he's he kind of, in a weird way, seems to be cut from the same cloth that Jalen Brunson is cut off from, right? Like a second round guard, a guy who's had some great college experience and is tough minded. So what better guard would you want to play behind than a guy like Jalen Brunson, who sort of has that same mentality and that same culture that has sort of infiltrated his Knicks team, which is why they've been playing so well this entire year. Hi guys, sorry. Looks like we can't hear Ian. We can't hear you, so we're gonna have to double check Ian's mic. Uh, in the meantime, okay, all right. I will okay. ask you guys a quick <laughs> trivia question that I had earlier. Okay. So, Mitchell Robinson mentioned potentially coming off the bench. The last time that Mitchell Robinson was coming off the bench in some full time capacity was 2019, 2020, which Nick started the most games at center that season. And his cancer. You guys name the player. Not Ennis Cantor. Brendan, ah. you have a guess? Nope. <laughs> I, t- I tend to black that, that whole season out. And that's when <laughs> I started yelling M Rob all the time, every time he got a block, because the team was so bad and he was like the only guy who could make an exciting play. Yeah. Uh, yeah dude, I, I did that. seven seasons, seven seasons of darkness. I'm the only <laughs> MSG or MSG Networks employee who did every <laughs> single game in seven years. No one in TV, no one that sells tickets or works a concession. I'm the only guy. And we commend you for it. Uh, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I love to say you've seen some things. You've seen some things. But, <laughs> but M. Robin's rookie year was fun, except for the game when he fouled out against Vucevic in Orlando in nine minutes. He played nine minutes and fouled out. <laughs> well, the answer, guys, is is an obvious one because there is no other answer to a Tom Thibodeau trivia question than Taj Gibson. Taj Gibson. Taj Gibson. Why, why did not think of that? Why did not think games. of that? You should have known. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, and that's Kev, not Tibbs. To... Tibbs isn't the coach that year. It's right, right. No, but I know. But it just ha- having the Taj <laughs> connection. Right. Um, guys, I want to follow up on one thing you said about. Deuce, just the kind of player is because you mentioned quickly, and I feel like in in some ways the, the roles that they've accepted because I think that was such a huge miss for the. All right, wait, wait, just left. just just stop, just stop. Okay, he didn't score in two of the last ten games. He yeah. averages one assist in eighteen minutes off the bench. He's averaging seven points in eighteen minutes off the bench. He had a great game. It's a great game. He played 11 minutes the game before it. Not suggesting that they're similar players. Quickly We're just averaged talking about 15 points a game totally over understand. 24 minutes this year. He's the runner-up for sixth man of the year. He scored 38 points at Boston. And what did it all amount to in the playoffs? He had one good game out of nine games. You're right. You can't compare think... McBride. You can't compare McBride not the and score. no manual quickly. Not, now, not is he a viable? Is he a viable guy? Like, are we going in that direction for real? Yeah, we are. I was more yeah, just going to bring up the, the, the playoffs, especially Kaz, just because Brennan, you mentioned quickly did struggle in the playoffs last year. So, do you expect Deuce to have a role in the playoffs? Um, because it depends quickly, who they play. Because we just right. saw it with Sacramento and Golden State, where Tibbs played Burks over McBride, which is mind-boggling. But they were going under everything. They were going under every pick and roll. They were going under every dribble hand, which is a huge part of Sabonis and the offense. So Tibbs played guys with size against Fox, and most of the game against Monk, they did chase Monk a little bit in the second half. So he doesn't want Deuce in that action. So it depends who they play. But he's yeah, to, to, to follow up your point, to follow up your point about Manuel quickly. Yeah, Manuel quickly is is is. Far the far better scorer and playmaker than Deuce McBride is, obviously. But I think there was a, a very, you know, a very uh, deliberate sort of change in philosophy when it came to the playing style of what Tom Thibodeau wanted to do after R.J. Barrett and Emmanuel Quickly and Obi Toppin were, you know, pretty much jettisoned 
from this Knicks team. They wanted to identify the, the culture of what Tom Thibodeau wants, and that has been defense first. And since then, they've had games where they have – they've had stretches of games throughout this NBA season where they've looked like the best defensive team in the league. So maybe the answer isn't where am I going to find this extra 15 points off the bench to help beat the Miamis or the Milwaukees or the Clevelands of the world. It's how are we going to throw extra bodies at Donovan Mitchell, extra bodies at Damian Lillard, extra bodies – at a uh, uh, Derek White who can have big games. Um, you know, all these guys that that are going to be, I believe, difference makers in the playoffs. And even though Miles McBride didn't score in certain games or, or didn't have certain situations, he's had moments where they're just asking them to hold the fort. Hold the fort down. Don't give up the lead. Don't have Jalen Brunson go sit down for two minutes and go from up 10 to down six, right? Like, just hold it down. And the best part, the best way to do that is defensively, I guess, according to Tom Thibodeau. So um, I I don't think he'll be Emmanuel quickly. I mean, I think Emmanuel quickly is is a starting point guard in this league and is going to get paid a ton of money next year to do that for the Toronto Raptors. But I do believe Deuce McBride has a sort of niche on this team. I think he's there's a reason why of all the Tibbs kids that were drafted in the past four years between Grimes, Toppin, Byron, and Quickly, he's the last one standing. He kind of, uh, you know, epitomizes more of a Tibbs player than a lot of these other guys are. So I, I think, I think you know, Tibbs sees something in him, and he may not be the scorer that Quickly is, but I do think he'll have just as much of an impact as quickly might have, just not offensively. Looks like we have knocked out every topic of manageable <laughs> right now with this Nick team. Uh, we appreciate, especially the spirit of debate at the end here. On uh, I love it. Yeah, this was fantastic. Uh, Brendan Brown, Kaz, Femuide, we appreciate you guys. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your insight. That'll do it for us on the putback. We will be back with you early April as the Knicks close out the regu- <clears throat> close out the regular season and get ready for the postseason. So be sure to keep an eye on that and keep an eye on Honda Sports Night every night for your Knicks coverage.